Welcome to this edition of Rattling the Bars. I'm Master Moose, co-host with Eddie Conway. We're here today in Washington, D.C., in front of the Department of Justice, doing a demonstration in support of Matulu Shakur. Matulu Shakur is a political prisoner, been locked up over three decades for nothing other than being a good human being and a good man. Matulu Shakur was uh, found guilty and in being found guilty, he was sentenced under what they call the old law. And under the old law, everything that uh, prisoners had during that time, parole, uh, diminution of credits, was allowed to be given to him. You have a brother who has served 36 years in prison. Per the law, he was eligible for, for parole years ago, six years ago, right? Yeah. So if the law states that he is eligible for compassion, after serving 30 years in prison, then why wouldn't they give it to him? Yet they have denied him nine times. That's unheard of, right? In the federal system, this is an old law prisoner who deserves to come home, who is deathly ill. It is a great honor and privilege to be standing here before all of you to ask for the immediate compassionate release of Dr. Matulu Shakur. Having my mentor, Susan Rosenberg, to tell me about who he was and who he is over the years since my release from federal prison allowed me to understand uh, why it was important for us to advocate and make sure that I was standing here for young people like me to make sure that we're forcing everything and every might that we have to make sure that Dr. Matulu Shakur is released from federal prison today. Today, the actions that was taken on behalf of the Free Matulu Shakur Committee, Support Committee, was they delivered a petition that was signed by over 200 faith leaders to be delivered to the Department of Justice, the rural prisons, and the uh, Parole Commission on behalf of Matulu Shakur, the purpose of which is to get Matulu Shakur compassionate relief. We recognize that this government has a selective amnesia when it comes to compassion. Uh, for example, John Hinckley got compassion. Matula Shakur's uh, co-defendant has gotten compassion. Why do you think they're so reluctant to give him compassion uh, with all the great works he's done? Well, that's, you probably hit it on the head. Uh, the great works lead to stature. And stature means that people see you. People admire you. You have an influence. You have an impact just by your presence. And that's what he has, an impact just by his presence. And that makes the system fearful, particularly a system that wants to basically control the narrative, control the message, control the image. It makes that system very harsh and, 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 and evil in terms of the way they treat somebody. He has acknowledged his uh, crimes and he has shown compassion and um, asked for forgiveness for that. And so in this moment, um, due to his medical state, like we said, his weight was around 125. He has combined to a wheelchair and he's been moved to the medical ward of the federal prison institution. Which one? Which Oh, he's currently located in Lexington, um, Kentucky. He's important because when I did have the opportunity to meet him while he was incarcerated decades later, he was still committed to the betterment of black people. And not just black people, but those communities who are marginalized and forgotten about. And he did it so selflessly. Like, he didn't just stop once incarcerated. He organized, he created peaceful places where our people were. And I thought that that was just necessary. So why could I not be active? on his behalf. See, my background is daughter of veterans, both parents, family of veterans. I believe every war fought in this country. I have had family in that war. And so to see that there were conditions in the country that we needed to address, drug issues, like drug abuse, housing issues, literacy, access to food. And this man who has then did not let his situation and circumstances stop that commitment made 
made me say, hey, we must be active and do something about that. Currently, like on Small Factors, Baba Matulu is 71 years old. In two weeks, he will be 72. His birthday is August 8th. So age alone, he is eligible for, as an aging elder, he's eligible for a compassionate release. And then on top of that, you add his health conditions. He's dealing with stage three bone marrow cancer. He um, it did not go into remission. He got he received treatments and it's not there. He's dealing. He has gotten COVID three times. So during this pandemic, that was even like early releases of COVID releases, and he did not meet the commands of that. Then on top of that, he is basically now given a six months timeline, and this was months ago. So although we're stuck with that number of six months, we're talking three months, maybe even six weeks. It's a very day to day. We have to do this now. And so I just believe as I believe in dignity. Mm -hmm. I believe in what these, like sitting in Washington, D.C., the capital of this nation, that we are supposed to stand on these principles. He has served his time. He should be allowed to die with dignity amongst us. And that's even horrible, sad to say, because like he's been incarcerated since I was three years old, never knowing which way pathway my was. He has family, he has grandkids. And so I think like with his time served, with his eligibility for parole 10 times, in this moment, he meets the declaration of compassionate release and thus we should do that it's a humane thing to do it's a dignity like dignified thing to do and it's um yeah the DOJ has that power to do that in in light of everything that we've already established that he meet the criteria for the compassion I would like to for y'all to dial down on why are they so reluctant to uh, acknowledge these accomplishments because parole been denied and he, he frisked the criteria for parole. So he should have been released. What is the, what is the opposition? What are, what are the, uh, the institutions offering in opposition to why they don't want to? They claim, they state that he is a danger to public safety, a danger to society, and that he has the capacity to influence uh, many people. That is what their rationale is. They don't speak to the fact that he's a 71-year-old elder. They don't speak to the fact that he has been incarcerated for 36 years. They don't speak to the fact that he has, yes, he has influenced, very positively influenced so, so, so many young black men in prison to turn their lives around and to be about, um, um, you know, being productive. They don't speak about those, um, uh, uh, those things. So it is vindictiveness. I submit there's racial disparity involved in it, as I spoke um, earlier, because it's not the nature necessarily of the crime, because other people committed um, offenses that the United States considers as uh, crime, but have been let home, and have been let home under compassionate release to die peacefully with family and friends. So we need, that's what the call to action must be. We need to really raise our collective voices Okay, so that we are heard, so that we are heard in the halls of the Department of Justice, so that we are heard in the halls of Congress, so that we are heard in the corridors of the White House. That is what is going to free Dr. Matulu Shakur. He has letters from former wardens. He has letters from former judges. He has letters from the community. He has letters from, as I mentioned, 200 faith leaders all saying that Matulu Shakur is not only not a threat, but that he's uh, will be an asset when he's upon return. Also, another thing that that need to be recognized about Matulu Shakur's case is that under the Bureau of Prisons guidelines, he scored real low. And when you score real low in terms of the points, that means you automatically be reduced to a lesser security and uh, and be positioned to be returned to society. So the only reason why Matulu Shakur is being kept in prison is for no other reason than binge vindictiveness and nothing more. Here we are, I have Nikishi Taifa, uh, the moderator of the Free Matulu Shakur demonstration that we're having today. That in a short time, we'll be delivering a letter to the Justice Department to try to free Matulu Shakur. Taifa, you spoke about uh, racial uh, disparity and why Matulu Shakur is not being given the benefit that the law says he should be given. Speak on that. Uh, yes, well, actually, Dr. Machula Shakur's co defendant, uh, Marilyn Buck, um, a white woman revolutionary, received 
the ability to be able to be released several months before she passed. She applied for this release. She was charged with many of the same charges that Matula Shakur was charged with. She was released to be able to go home to die. Why? Why should Matula Shakur not be granted that same type of relief? His thinking is uh, has been so monumental in terms of changing individuals. But yet you reflected on how they always talk about the crime and always talk, talk about why his thinking is so dangerous to the point where they believe that he will be a threat to society. Well, what the government basically says is that Matula Shakur will be an influence to people on the outside. What they neglect to say is that he is an influence, a very positive influence. He has been a very positive influence to young people in prison, young black men to turn their lives around from a life of crime and criminal activity to productive um, um, you know, people in society, to get them to open up a book and to read the thing that they're trying to take out of the school well, Dr. Matulu Shakur wants that history, the true history of who we are and how we came to this country to be. He's a healer. He's been teaching and training people in the art of acupuncture, acupuncture detoxification, which has been a tremendous help to the um, uh, community. George Jackson talked about the rumbling of our feet. You talking about the rumbling of our feet. Speak on what you think we should be doing. What you think we need to do when we leave here. You gave us our march order. Now get the rattling of our views, our march order. Well, we need the rumbling of our voices as well as our feet. We need the rumbling of our voices so that they can be heard within the Department of Justice, so that they can be heard within the halls of Congress, within, they can be heard within the corridors of the White House. Each of those entities have the capacity to do what is necessary to free Matulu Shakur through either parole, the granting of parole, through either the granting of compassionate release, through the granting of executive clemency, so he will be able to walk out as a free uh, person. None of those things have been um, um, allocated to Matulu Shakur, despite all of the great benefit that he's done um, to society. Most folk don't know he is the stepfather of Brother Tupac That's Shakur. Right. Many right. folk don't know that because of him, Asada Shakur is living free in uh, Cuba. Many people don't know that because of Matulu Shakur and others like him, resources were able to be garnered to the liberation movements in Southern Africa. Many people don't know these facts about Matulu Shakur, that because of him, many people who could have died from addiction mm -hmm. received a second chance at life through the therapies that Matulu Shakur was able to provide and able to teach others. We organized an organization called BAD, Blacks Against Drugs, where we got all of the progressive black drug programs uh, around the country to come together and to continue to promote a revolutionary progressive form uh, of treatment. Uh, I received my first treatment uh, from Matulu Shakur in 1972 uh, and then began to study uh, acupuncture. Dr. Shakur started Lincoln Detox Program uh, in 1970, which, um, you know, deems him the father uh, of acupuncture in our black community. And here today we have thousands and thousands of uh, individuals, yeah, you know, uh, using acupuncture and a specific protocol uh, to deal with substance abuse. So Dr. Shakur is such a threat because of his ability to be able to commit communicate this because of his ability to be able to teach, because of his ability to be able to bring people together from all walks of life to understand the importance of being human and to begin to deal with uh, the problem that we're faced today, especially with fentanyl. So acupuncture is proven to deal with substance abuse. Right. We go to China. The whole country was addicted That's to opium right. and they used right. acupuncture. And here we run back here to the 70s and through the 70s up until today, they've been using acupuncture in the hospitals. The Veterans Administration has a protocol right. uh, based on that same protocol that Matulu started. Uh, they call it battleground acupuncture, uh, where they deal with the post-traumatic stress syndromes yeah. that black folk are dealing with, post-traumatic slave syndrome right. that we're dealing with and all the stress and repressive kind of uh, emotions that we have uh, that this acupuncture can address. I think, yeah. you know, we need to demystify uh, what the government is saying about this problem. Yes, And we need sure. to really humanize him that the, and make him the human, the human being that 
we know him to be, but more importantly, you have actually experienced him with him. Yes, and uh, when he smiled, he would light up a room. When he came into a room, he would light that room up in his energy uh, and his ability to be able to, you know, just mingle and talk and hang out with people. Uh, we danced all night long, yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. so he could dance, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, but the major thing I remember is his being a dad. Okay. Uh, is him being a husband. That's right. Uh, is him being a brother, um, you know, to all of the people within his family. Him being a son, his mother who was blind, uh, and me watching him do acupuncture on her and taking care of her. Uh, me watching him take care of children that wasn't even his children, because that's how we do in our community. Right. Him giving his shirt, you know, to a guy right off the street. Here, brother, take this shirt. That's right. This is the kind of person that Matulu was. He was so into making sure that black people got as much as they could to to do the best to come out of the conditions that we were in. So it didn't matter whether it was a dollar bill, acupuncture, a sandwich, you know, some clothes, or just a hug. And Matulu had the best hugs. So often we hear it's always about the nature of the crime. The nature of the crime never changes. Being incarcerated is supposed to be about rehabilitation, right? Corrections. And if the system is saying that he couldn't have been corrected in 30 years, then what are we also saying about the system? What do you think the church in particular should be doing in this space? Where do we go from here in terms of like trying to get the, the church to become more involved in doing the work that Jesus would be doing right about now? Well, I mean, we know the history of the church is or has been in the past to be leaders in these movements of civil rights and human rights. And so nothing has changed. As a matter of fact, we need the church more now than ever before. So we need the churches to be social justice this hubs to bringing people together to be leaders in this movement to free our people because the word says that we need to set the prisoners free and so that's just I mean that's the bottom line good afternoon everyone I'm sharing these words on behalf of my father Reverend Anthony Carroll of First Pilgrim Baptist Church in Camden Delaware these are his words he states I first came to know of Dr. Matulu through my son Though I was aware of the Black Panther Party and their actions in California while I was in service in the military, I was not so knowledgeable of what they did on the East Coast of the United States. Born and raised in Hackensack, New Jersey, the Black Panther Party was something that I only heard about on the news, but not something that I had real interaction with. However, after learning more and more about the actions of the Panthers outside of California and those such as Matulu Shakur, who was in New York, I learned of the many accomplishments and advances he and other Panthers were making in New York City so close to my home. As I learned that Matulu Shakur was an organizer, alternative health professional, and advocate for so many people, oppressed people, marginalized people. I wondered why this man has been incarcerated for over 30 years and is continuously denied parole. Furthermore, during his incarceration, Dr. Shakur has been a role model to those moving through various penal institutions that he has been housed. Again, I wondered why this man is locked up and not free. And still, as he suffers from type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidema, uh, glaucoma, I still ask why this man is incarcerated. From all that I've learned of Dr. Matulu Shakur, I see a man who is about justice, freedom, equality, and someone who is continuously fighting oppression whenever it is faced. And I'm reminded of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 14, which reads, in part, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression. Dr. Shakur has consistently tried to do this, but the real question is why hasn't he been allowed to do, continue this work as a free man? There you have the real news about Matulu Shakur. We'll continue to follow up on this uh, act of releasing Matulu Shakur. Matulu Shakur has had a positive impact on society at large and people in general. And the only reason why Matulu Shakur is not being released and not being granted the benefits of compassionate release is because of his thinking and his thinking being that of a progressive individual. With Eddie Conway, I'm Mansa Musa. Thank you very much.